Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. On behalf of USAID, Feed the Future, and AgriLinks, I want to welcome you to our webinar, Into, Through, and Beyond USAID Programs, Lessons from the Women's Empowerment Agriculture Index. I'm Michael Saltz with AgriLinks, and before we start our event, I want to orient you to the BlueJeans platform. On the right side of your screen, you'll see most of your controls. First, please use the chat to introduce yourself and network with colleagues from around the world. To ask questions, you can use the Q&A button in the bottom right. Please indicate who your question is for and feel free to upvote questions you want answered. You can ask questions throughout the event and our Q&A session will be at the end of the webinar. If the presentation is too small on your screen, you can use the slide bar at the bottom of the window to adjust the view. Lastly, we are recording this webinar and we'll email you the post-event resources as soon as they are available. You can also find the resources at agrilinks.org when they are ready. Thank you for your attention. I will now pass it to USAID's Farzana Ramzan. Thank you, Michael. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone attending today's event from around the world. My name is Farzana Ramzan. I am a senior gender advisor in the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security at USAID. Today's presentation called Into, Through, and Beyond USAID Programs, Lessons from the Women's Empowerment in Agriculture Index is co-hosted by USAID and AgriLinks, the CGIAR Gender Impact Platform, and IFPRI Bangladesh. And we're joined by one of our implementing partners leading this work, Develop Metrics. Next slide, please. Next slide. And one more time, next slide, thank you. Before we begin, I wanted to share that earlier this week, Administrator Power launched the USAID's updated 2023 Gender Equality and Women's Empowerment Policy. The 2023 Gender Policy provides the vision for USAID's work to advance gender equality and women's empowerment around the world. Establishing our strategic objectives and driving investments across our operations and programs in order to achieve these aims. Through this updated policy, USAID reaffirms that gender equality and women and girls empowerment are fundamental for the realization of human rights and key to effective and sustainable development outcomes. Next slide, please. The principles underpinning the updated gender policy have guided USAID programs for years. It is these principles that led to the development of the Women's Empowerment in Agriculture Index, or the WIA, or WEA for short. Over a decade ago, at the start of Feed the Future, the evidence was clear that although women around the world played a critical role in agricultural growth, they faced persistent barriers, both social and economic, that limited their participation in the sector. As you can see here on the left, one of the objectives at the start of Feed the Future and reflected in our first results framework is inclusive agriculture sector growth. However, we recognized that to be intentional about how we included women in agriculture, we needed a way to measure success. Developed by USAID, the International Food Policy Research Institute and the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative, the WIA was the first ever measure to directly capture women's empowerment and inclusion in the agriculture sector. Today, the results framework in our updated global food security strategy continues to focus on inclusive and sustainable agriculture-led economic growth as one of three objectives and elevates inclusion, equity, and equality as essential for achieving these outcomes. Feed the Future continues to use WIA metrics to monitor program performance and track changes in women's empowerment and gender equality that occur as a direct or indirect result of Feed the Future programs globally. Next slide, please. So now, before we begin, before we dive into today's presentation, I wanted to give a quick refresher on the WIA or WIA 101. The WIA is composed of two sub-indices. The first assesses the degree to which women are empowered in five domains of agriculture, the 5DE. And the second sub-index, the Gender Parity Index, 
or GPI, measures gender parity within surveyed households. GPI reflects the percentage of women who are equally empowered as the men in their households. And for those households that have not achieved gender parity, the GPI shows the empowerment gap that needs to be closed for women to reach the same levels of empowerment as men. The 5DE is weighted at 90% and the GPI is weighted at 10%. Next slide, please. This slide is important to really understand and interpret the results that will be presented on the WIA evidence synthesis coming up next. The original WIA was focused on empowerment in agriculture, and the five domains included in the index were decisions about agricultural production, access to and decision-making power about productive resources, control of use of income, leadership in the community, and time allocation. 10 indicators were included within those domains, which you could see on the slide here. Next slide, please. The WIA has evolved over time to meet the needs of different users. For example, the abbreviated WIA, or the AWIA, which was released in 2015, builds on the original WIA, though shortens the interview length and modifies questions that were difficult to implement in the field. It includes the same five domains, though only six indicators, and maintains cross-cultural applicability. The project level WIA, or the pro WIA, measures women's empowerment in various types of agricultural development projects. This version uses the AWIA as a starting point and adds specialized project relevant modules. The pro WIA is made up of 10 indicators that measure three types of agency, intrinsic agency or the power within, instrumental agency or the power to, and collective agency or the power with. Next slide, please. And now back to the big picture. Our partners at IFPRI have been tracking the use of WIA-based metrics globally and developed this visualization. Last year was the 10th anniversary of the development of the WIA, and we learned that 232 organizations in 58 countries were collecting WIA-based metrics. That prompted us to want to understand what we learned from USAID's use of the WIA, as well as how the data and evidence generated from the index helped to shape and influence policies and programs, which you'll hear from the Bangladesh team later today. We hope that today's presentation is engaging and informative. And now I would like to hand it over to Lindsay Moore, CEO and founder of Develop Metrics, who will lead the first half of today's presentation on lessons learned from USAID's use of the video. Lindsay, over to you. Thanks so much, Farzana. Good morning, evening, and afternoon to everyone. I'm very happy to be here with you. Uh, as Farzana mentioned, we, were, we worked with USAID and IFPRI to explore 10 years of evidence in the, in the WIA. Uh, and so we'll present those findings right now. Um, and also after this quick presentation, we'll show you an online dashboard um, that has more dynamic access to the various findings. Next slide. Great, so the methodology for this, uh, this research was incredibly interesting because of the incredible breadth of documents and available uh, talking about the WIA. So in order to capture the, the incredible amount of evidence, we needed to use machine learning technology um, to look over more than 250,000 documents from the Development Clearinghouse, which is the USAID's repository of all project level documents from evaluations to planning documents um, to baseline research studies. And the goal was really to understand how has the WEA been implemented within USAID projects and activities over the past decade. Um, and so th through using machine learning, we were able to identify and also classify more than 2,500 uh, use cases of the WEA. And we we're also able to label these use cases based on uh, data architecture derived from the uh, State of Food and Agriculture report, as well as from if IFPRI experts. All this data is aggregated into the WEA dashboard, which we will show at the end of the presentation, um, which we're working towards making public so that everyone can see every single one of these, uh, these use cases. Um, the idea is that really this will, this will help provide insights into future policies and programming to further the advantages of the WEA and the opportunities, but also address some of the challenges that we'll discuss. Next slide. 
So what did we want to know? We had three key research questions. We wanted to know how has the, the way have been utilized over this incredible breadth that, that Farzana mentioned of countries and partners. We wanted to know what are the key lessons and recommendations from all the uses. Uh, and then we wanted to, to label it and understand the trends in uses as related to um, the food systems framework. Next slide. So question one, uh, how has it been used? Next slide. So we'll get deeper into this into the dashboard itself, but overall, as Farzana outlined, the, the documentation reviewing every single uh, USA document, document mentioning the way uh, really um, brought out all the use cases, showing that there is a widespread adoption of the way, uh, um, and, and it has gained popularity in certain regions. You can see Bangladesh, which luckily we'll be hearing from after this presentation, is the largest user of uh, the WIA with 46 use cases, um, but it, its popularity hasn't spread necessarily to other parts of, of Asia. Um, Africa overall as a region uses it the most, and South America is, is, has the biggest gap. So just looking at the geographic dispersion of the usage, you can see that there is a need to promote its use in other parts of the world to better assess and address gender equalities uh, in agriculture. Next slide. Uh, we'll dive deeper into this, into the dashboard, but this looks at the overall um, partners that have, have used the WEA. It just shows overall that it has gained widespread recognition and use among various organizations and institutions really worldwide, which indicates its effectiveness in addressing gender inequalities in, in the agriculture sector. Next slide. Uh, we have a uh, EMU here because of <laughs> The um, identifying, informing, monitoring, and understanding it are the four key ways that we saw that the, the WIA has been used. And it really, the, the various use cases of how the WIA has been used addresses um, the, or really demonstrate the tool's vers versatility. Um, so in terms of identifying constraints, the so WIA was, uh, has used often to figure out what are the biggest challenges that women are facing um, in agriculture. Uh, and it enables stakeholders to revise policies and programming programs to address these gender inequalities. Um, and so it's an incredible, valuable way without, me you know, without measuring and understanding constraints, there's of course no way you can address it. And, and so that's an incredibly valuable uh, service provided by the, by the WIA. It also informs policy and strategy decisions. Um, you can see examples next to each of these con uh, use cases or each of these um, applications rather. So, for example, the Feed the Future strategy uh, gender-sensitive approach was really informed by the rich information on gender equalities um, that enables these stakeholders to improve strategy and design. And then, of course, monitoring project. Um, because the way it enables uh, partners to track changes in women's empowerment levels resulting from specific interventions uh, and monitors progress towards gender equality goals over time, this is an incredibly valuable tool to improve uh, project performance and impact uh, over time. Uh, and finally, just understanding gender dynamics. Uh, it, it really interestingly, the WIA measures uh, women's empowerment relative to men, which is a, a huge addition, and it provides uh, different stakeholders with a more robust understanding of, of gender dynamics. Next slide. Uh, so our question two is, so how do all these use cases align with the various themes uh, that we're interested in? So next slide. So this chart here looks at how has WEA usage changed over time. And what it shows is the um, popularity of each use case within uh, the overall portfolio. And what's really interesting here is that we see a shift in the WEA towards measuring um, women's empowerment in relationship to or the relationship between women's empowerment and nutrition and dietary diversity, um, and less looking at women's empowerment overall or specifically um, in terms of agricultural production. Uh, so the interesting trends here, which we then would predict moving forward, is that the WIA is being used to look more specifically into other sectors because its utility um, can, can be valuable in other, other sectors. Um, we see that WASH in, is, not, um, is rising potentially in popularity. Um, but there's also some gaps. For example, we looked at how has the way have been used to measure the relationship between uh, women's empowerment and education, or um, women's empowerment and life satisfaction, or environmental outcomes, and those we have not yet seen yet, but given these trends, we're predicting that it will be used more in the future to, um, 
to look at more specifically into women's empowerment and the relationship between women's empowerment and these really uh, important themes. Uh, next slide. So we won't go into the, there's so many use cases and examples, um, and, and we won't go into every one given our, our limited time, but we do like want to credit to, just want to out, outline some of the key um, findings. So in terms of women's empowerment overall, it, it probably won't surprise people on this call uh, that women were found to be more disempowered than men across all indicators and all reported use cases. Um, so really the credit was found to be one of the biggest constraints empowering women, um, on empowering women in agriculture. Um, and also leadership, you know, in over 50 different projects, we found that women were excluded from local planning processes um, and also division of labor. So a uh, way time use indicator has provided insights into the gender division of labor within households. And it shows, it identifies ways to reduce um, work burden, women's work burden. So an example um, from one of the use cases is a 2018 WEA survey in uh, North Macedonia indicated that women on, in agriculture work on average over 11 hours per day with 42% of that being unpaid. Uh, while men work an average of 9.7 and which is mainly paid. Uh, and so using these, this survey to, to really um, measure, you know, what's happening provides incredible insights that then, uh, then can be addressed through, through programming. Uh, next slide. Uh, agricultural production was the second most common theme. Um, and again, of course, it's a critical area where women face significant challenges. We see that, that the, the trend we just talked about, about lack of access to credit, then filters down into lack of access to inputs um, because they are, do, don't have the financial means to, to access input, inputs, which really uh, hinders and you know, it restricts their ability to participate in agricultural production. Um, and um, also, technology adoption has been a huge con constraint. Um, for example, the, the Victory Against Malnutrition Plus project found that we are results in Burkina Faso and Niger um, indicate that without adequate access to important technologies that can improve their economic productivity, women will continue to be limited in their empowerment. Um, so we're really seeing uh, that, that if these constraints that are found aren't addressed, we will continue to go against the same barriers that, that we've been facing in the past. Um, and in this way, the data really helps us to uh, not re recreate the wheel every time, but really understand what's happened. And, and, and so we can look forward um, and, and make appropriate adjustments. Next slide. Uh, nutrition, as we mentioned, is a, is a rising theme in importance. Um, it was found in 96 use cases to measure the relationship between women's empowerment and nutritional status. Um, it's often used to, to make recommendations on how to invigorate pathways to women's empowerment. For example, um, the Feed the Future Tanzania Land Tenure Assistance Project used, utilized a way to measure the relationship between women's empowerment and stunting in, in children uh, five years old. Um, next slide. Um, and then di dietary diversity and food security was uh, one of the less frequent themes, but was still used to look at the relationship between women's decision-making power and their control over their diet, as, as well as the diet of their children and their household. Um, for example, one use case we pulled out is the Resilience and Economic Growth in the Sahel Project used the way to measure changes in women's empowerment and nutrition status, nutrition status in Niger. And so the, the project found a positive correlation between improvement in women's empowerment and improvement in household dietary diversity and micronutrient intake, um, which just shows the importance of women's empowerment as a keystone in, um, in nutrition, uh, in dietary diversity and food security. Next slide. So um, the, the other topics that, that we discussed earlier, you know, environmental outcomes, uh, we did not see the, the way I used to look at the relationship between women, uh, women's empowerment and environmental outcomes that much, except for um, a really interesting use case in Ghana, the Feed the Future Ghana Agriculture and Natural Resource Management Project, used the way to assess women's empowerment in agriculture and how it relates to their adoption of climate smart agriculture practices. Uh, which was really interesting. It looked at things like small-scale irrigation, soil and water conservation, and drought-tolerant, uh, high-yielding crop varieties. And it found that women um, who are more empowered in agriculture were more likely to adopt climate-smart agriculture practices. 
Uh, so that, that's, you know, while we identified what all the different areas that WOYA is contributing, these gaps in terms of um, looking at environmental outcomes, as well as WASH education and life satisfaction outcomes. So there's a huge opportunity to expand the use of, of this tool to measure these important sectors, to look at how women's and look at the relationship between women's empowerment and, and these key um, outcomes. Next slide. Uh, so looking at rec recommendations and lessons. Next slide. Uh, okay, so this is the last slide before we'll just quickly show the um, dashboard. But, you know, as the, the WIA is a survey tool, it, it um, faces many of the same challenges that, that surveys face, you know, uh, going to remote areas, difficulty um, with safety. But there are also some very specific uh, lessons and recommendations to the WEA that can be categorized in three in three main groups. Um, one is related to the abbreviate, abbreviated survey that Farzana mentioned. So shortening survey modules was identified in almost in a lot of use cases as an effective strategy to reduce respondent burden and, and minimize selection bias and also re improve results result rates. So that's a great um, you know idea to use the abbreviated WEA. Um, in, in Malawi, it was found to reduce interview time by approximately 30%. Um, but at the same time, it's really important not to, to arbitrarily drop survey questions because that can compromise the comparability and the integrity of the index. Um, so it, it's important to, to, to be careful in doing that, but it, it is, has been an effective strategy. Also, a um, key topic was challenges faced by respondents. Of course, you know, the topic of women's empowerment is a very sensitive topic that is prone to sociocultural influences that can potentially introduce bias into the, into the WIA results. We saw that, um, you know, in some cases, asking about who is the head of the household, um, you know, they don't want to be, the respondents don't want to be judged if they say the man or the woman runs the household. So it could be a tricky question. Um, one quote from, from Zambia, a Zambia survey, one uh, respondent reported, uh, quote, that it makes someone wonder why someone would want to know your household dynamics. What are their intentions? I was not comfortable with the way the question was coming out. Uh, and so you can see, of course, if you're asking about household dynamics, it can get um, complicated. And so it's just recommended to address these concerns early on by explaining the, the purpose of the survey and emphasizing the confidentiality uh, as well as adapting to the cultural norms. Um, and then the final aspect is just uh, nuance. Uh, there is a need for more nuanced ways of measuring certain domains of the way I like uh, time use, decision making, um, quality of leadership. So one, one recommendation is to go beyond the quantitative way of questionnaire and look at uh, broader gender issues through you know, focus groups or targeted interviews. Um, the pro way is really useful uh, at a project level. There are qualitative protocols that can be used alongside the way a survey to, to probe these issues. Uh, I think that's the last slide. No, is there any other slides? Let's see. No, great. Okay, I will just share my screen with the last couple minutes that I have to show um, the dashboard where we have all these results compiled. You just pulled that up. Great. You should be able to see the screen. Let me know uh, if it's not. Um, so, okay, thank you. Uh, so as we mentioned before, you saw the screenshot of this slide. This just shows where the way is being used, how many use cases. Um, we looked at the theme frequency. So you can look at each theme uh, that we labeled. And so, for example, if you wanted to see how is the WIA using, uh, being used to, to measure the relationship between nutrition and women's economic uh, empowerment, you can see, you can click on it and you can see um, down here the text that's been extracted from all the thousands of documents um, that discuss, that tells you the title of the report and the, the use, how the WIA was used, what country, um, and, and the theme code. Um, and so that helps to, to, to look more deeply into the qualitative information of how it's been used. You can also um, look by country, as my friends in Bangladesh are coming up next. You can see here how, how has it been used across the different themes in Bangladesh uh, and look at some more specific examples because Bangladesh is such a great use case um, of, of the WIA. Um, we also have all lessons and recommendations ex extracted if you want to read more about that. Um, and then, as we, we discussed earlier, the partners that have used the, the WIA 
you can see them categorized up here at the top in, in these colored squares. So for example, um, there, if you want to look at how has USAID used the WEA, you can see, of course, uh, as expected, RFS is, is the leading user at USAID, but you also see the mission to Bangladesh, um, Senegal, and then you can see other bureaus um, from the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance, um, even the Bureau for Management. Uh, and so this helps get an understand, understanding of who is using it and, and why. Um, the second largest utilizer of the WEA after USAID are implementing partners. So you can see ACDI VOCA really leads the way in using the WEA, um, followed by other uh, NGOs and private companies. Um, local governments, you can see, are less users, so that provides an opportunity of, of, of ways to expand it, but nonetheless have, have been using it. Um, research institutes, of course, if free leads the way there, but there are many others that are using it. Um, and I'll just show one more partner group. Universities uh, are a huge stakeholder in, in the WEA, and it's, um, you know, everything from University of Nairobi to Ohio State University. Um, so huge depth. So we'll, we're working towards making this available, so um, you can probe through the data yourself uh, if you are interested. Um, so thank you so much to, to everyone. Really appreciated being able to share these results. If you are interested more in um, how to use machine learning to understand, uh, you know, as Maya Angelou said, if, if you want to know where you're going, you have to know where you've been. And, and so now we know where we've been in the past decade with the way and you can um, then uh, create the exact, most exact strategies and evidence-based strategies to, to move forward. Uh, we have a white paper on the methodology coming up with the UN this week. Um, and happy to answer any questions. I will share my information in the chat. And uh, I think now I pass it over to the colleagues in Bangladesh, uh, Akhtar. Thank you. Uh, hello. Hello, my name is Akhtar Ahmed. I'm a IFPRI country representative in Bangladesh. I'm delighted to be here today to share with you some of the lessons learned from Bangladesh. My IFPRI colleague, Dr. Mehra Bakhtiar, has also joined me. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. yes, thank you. First, we start with the Bangladesh Integrated Household Survey designed by IFPRI and funded by USAID. Next slide, please. The Bangladesh Integrated Household Survey, or BIHS, is a nationally representative rural household survey that is the most comprehensive to date in the country. The survey was designed to be statistically representative nationally of rural Bangladesh and of the USAID supported Feed the Future Zone of Influence in Southwest Bangladesh. The survey was conducted in three rounds with the first round in 2011-12, the second round in 2015, and the third round in 2018-19. The BIHS has been designed with a broad integrated format and has several unique features. First, the survey collected data on plot level agricultural production practices. Second, individual dietary intake of all household members. Third, anthropometric measurements of all household members. And fourth, it collected data to estimate the women's empowerment in agriculture index or OER. Next slide, please. BIHS, uh, all these uh, uh, features have contributed to the BIHS emerging as a global public good. After all three rounds of data were published online for open access, the BIHS has been downloaded thousands of times in about 76 countries. Although it is difficult to track all publications that have used BIHS data, there are more than 150 peer reviewed articles that have been published in international regional and national journals that have used BIHS data. These articles have not only been published in many different journals, but may, many journals across different disciplines. 
This shows that BIHS data have been widely used and have benefited different fields. Also, data have been used to inform donor investments, including USAID's Feed the Future performance assessment by IFPRI and country strategic plans by the World Bank, IFAD, and USAID. Next slide, please. The BIHS generated the first ever national empowerment findings, making it an important resource for policymakers and researchers working to understand the status of women. As such, several key findings have been emerged. For example, women's empowerment score is positively associated with calorie availability and dietary diversity at the household level. A reduced empowerment gap between spouse and associated with uh, higher levels of technical efficiency. And higher women's empowerment score reduce the likelihood of households remaining in chronic and transient poverty. Next slide, please. It is important to consider how these insights have been applied in practice. This is where the Agriculture, Nutrition and Gender Linkages or ANGEL project comes in. Next slide, please. Using the BIHS 2011-12 data, IPRI researchers uncovered the linkages between agricultural diversity, dietary diversity, and women's empowerment in Bangladesh. Next slide, please. To enhance gender and nutrition sensitive agriculture, IFPRI research, researchers designed a randomized control trial known as ANGEL to identify the most effective combination of interventions. These interventions were implemented by the Bangladesh Ministry of Agriculture. The interventions consisted of four different training combinations, which were provided to farm household men and women together. These interventions included nutrition behavior change communication, agricultural production training, nutrition and agriculture production combined, and combining agriculture, nutrition, and gender sensitization. The government of Bangladesh extension officials implemented the interventions and Helen Keller International provided technical assistance. ANGEL was jointly funded by USAID and the government of Bangladesh. Next slide, please. The Women's Empowerment in Agriculture Index has gained significant, um, okay, I, I'm sorry. Um, to, um, Yes, ANGEL engaged men and women in activities that are associated with increased agriculture production and nutrition knowledge, production of select non-rice crops, consumption of food with high nutrient value, increased household diet diversity, empowerment of women and men, and gender parity between women and men in households. Next slide, please. The Women's Empowerment in Agriculture Index has gained significant recognition since its launch 10 years ago in 2012. In 2012, at the 56th Committee on the Status of Women's Side Event at the United Nations, the Bangladesh State Minister of Women and Children Affairs acknowledged WIA's potential for improving the status of women in rural Bangladesh. In 2018, WIA findings were instrumental in amending Bangladesh's national agriculture policy to add 
a section on women's empowerment. ANGEL was implemented from 2016 to 2018, and in 2020, it was approved by the government of Bangladesh for national expansion by the Ministry of Agriculture. In 2020, the Bangladesh Speaker of the Parliament, Dr. Shirin Sharmin Chaudhary, reaffirmed WIA's potential to inform gender sensitive policies, referencing ANGEL and other policies and programs in the country during the 66th Committee on the Status of Women event at the United Nations. Next slide, please. Although 15 minutes is insufficient to cover the entirety of OER contributions, I trust that this presentation offered a brief insights into how extensively OER has influenced the policy landscape in Bangladesh. Thank you for your attention. Over. Thank you so much, Akhtar um, and Lindsay. Those were really great, very interesting presentations. Um, hi, everybody. Um, my name is Hazel Malapid. I'm a senior research coordinator at IFPRI, and I've been working on the WEA since it was since it was born in uh, 2012. So it's been more than a decade. So uh, I'm I'm very pleased now to um, moderate the Q&A discussion. I see we have quite an active chat. A lot of questions have been posed. So I am just going to um, jump right in. Um, I think we're going to start, um, and actor, um, uh, please feel free to stay on screen. We will come to you soon for your questions. But for now, let's start with Lindsay. Um, so there are a couple of questions from Anne Swindale um, related to your presentation. So the first is, uh, how many of the project level use cases did the projects that collect the WEA data the, oh, sorry, that collect the WEA data directly versus use WEA data that had been collected by another group, for example, collected as part of a zone of influence population-based survey. Um, so that's the first question. Did they collect it directly or they're using secondary data, basically? Um, and then the second one is in the project level use cases, that directly collected data, which metric was collected, WEA, AWEA, or PROWEA, or just individual indicators, but not the entire index? Well, thanks, Anne. That's a comprehensive question. So um, really interesting. And, and we love different ways of disaggregating the data and looking at it at different angles. So thanks for giving us some new ones there. Um, so we actually, do, I, I don't know off the top of my head how many collected them um, directly versus zone of influence surveys, so we can quickly look that up um, and get back to you, but um, I know there were a lot of zone of influence surveys out there, so we'll, we can we can look at that. It would be interesting to see. Um, and, you know, in, in a lot of the results reporting did not, they did not themselves say which WIA version they used. We really wanted to, to look at that, um, but it wasn't super clear in the data, but, and again, we didn't disaggregate it, um, but we can. So both of those things are kind of, I'll have to Check out the data and, and get back to you um, on it. I don't know, Hazel, if you have any other thoughts on on that. No, I think we can we can leave it there. Um, we will follow up. I guess is is the is the bottom line. Um, okay, so uh, there is another another question for Lindsay. Um, Will and maybe I'll answer the question by Ruby Mize is: Are these results available to the public? How can we access this? Um, I'll, I'll give you first crack, Lindsay, <laughs> on where we are. Yeah, so we're hoping to. That is our, our goal, to make this publicly available. Uh, we're working towards it. We just need to get it uh, in the final approval phases, I believe. Right, Hazel? Right. And, and I should mention, I think somebody asked in the chat if there are reports related to what was presented today. And um, we are um, preparing a series of briefs around WEA that will summarize the key lessons that have been learned all throughout this past decade. And so please watch out for that. We're still, it's still in progress. So it's a work in progress, but it's coming soon. Um, now I come to you, Actor. There is a question um, 
Um, somebody says, I'm still unclear how the Bangladesh Integrated Household Survey relates to the WEA. Perhaps you can explain a little bit more. Thank you. Uh, Bangladesh Integrated Household Survey is the first survey that uh, collected data to estimate uh, WEA. Uh, it's the first national representative survey and also representative of the uh, Feed the Future Zone of Influence in Bangladesh. So, so, so yeah, I mean, this is a very comprehensive survey and a very comprehensive module on OIA to uh, collect all the questions, uh, I mean, uh, you know, data to estimate uh, OIA in Bangladesh. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Actor. And so the, j just to emphasize, I mean, Actor mentioned this in his presentation, but the BIHS is publicly accessible and that's part of the, the reason yes. why it's had had so much impact. So we encourage you, the person who is interested in BIHS, we encourage you to take a look at that data and use it. Um, okay, um, any other questions? So we have, so we have a question for you, Lindsay. Um, James Stevenson asks, how is usage defined in the charts? And a related question to that is um, maybe explain a little, a little bit more what is a use case and how is that different from like a PBS survey, which is maybe some people who are familiar with WEA kind of think of different ways of how they're using WEA. So. Yeah, sure. So we looked in Oh, yeah, thanks, Hazel. We looked at every uh, documented case of, of when the whale was used to measure something in a project. Uh, and we, so that would be one use case if it was used to measure different topics. So if one case was used to measure nutrition and another one to measure the relationship between women's empowerment and education, those were two separate. And if it was repeated within a project, then that was just one. So it was, uh, every time it was used to measure something separate, in uh, one project or in one um, survey use. Um, so that's how we define the, the use cases. We just made sure they, we weren't duplicating uh, anything. And it was organized by this data architecture from, uh, that we created with IFRI based on the um, food systems framework uh, that enabled us to, to kind of create that logical framework with which to categorize the use cases. Uh, more clearly, and when this available, the data is available, you can go in and kind of read each use case um, to see in more detail kind of what that what that looks like in practice. Okay, thank you. Um, and I'm seeing Farzana is still with us, so I'm going to give you a question, Farzana. Um, somebody asked, um, is the way I used as a compulsory set of indicators in nutrition sensitive agriculture projects in all USAID financed projects? How can it be used to consistently guide project design and implementation? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Currently, USAID, we use um, the abbreviated WIA in our population-based surveys uh, that are collected in the zone of influence, which is the area where Feed the Future concentrates its programming in a particular country. And so we have this large population-based survey and the WIA is one of the module, abbreviated WIA, is one of the modules that are embedded within that survey and that's collected every few years. Um, however, we are currently exploring um, piloting um, a streamlined version of the project level WIA, which I talked about in uh, today's presentation earlier on, to more systematically um, collect, report on, and use uh, project level women's empowerment and gender equality data to guide our how USAID describes our activity level programming. So we know, for example, from today's presentation, from Lindsay's analysis, from the example from Bangladesh, um, and around the world that there are a lot of use cases of the WIA and at USAID, uh, we don't have a systematic way of tracking uh, those use cases and a standardized way of promoting uh, the way the data is collected other than through our population-based surveys. So, you know, we're really excited to see that so many of our partners are collecting it and we hope to um, promote and support uh, the standardized collection of the data and also increase its utility to guide our programs and policies. Thank you, Farzana. Um, Okay, next we have a question about um, 
Can you talk about how WEA has been used in market systems projects? Uh, so before I, I have some thoughts on this, but maybe actor, um, since you know everything going on in Bangladesh <laughs> regarding the WEA, any, any thoughts on that? WEA in market systems? Well, uh, we did a study uh, in the Feed the Future Zone of Influence in Bangladesh on, uh, you know, uh, how we are uh, influences uh, participation in market system. Uh, so that was the value chain, the value chain study uh, where we uh, you know, did both uh, quantitative and qualitative uh, surveys. Uh, uh, you know, uh, so, so that is, uh, uh, I think, the only study that uh, actually relates to market system or uh, agricultural value chains. I should mention that we actually recently just had an event, a policy seminar at IFPRI, where we launched some new um, add-on mod add modules for the PROWEA for market inclusion. And the, that work was really drawing on four case studies. Bangladesh was one of them. Um, the other countries were Philippines, um, Benin and Malawi, those were, I think Bangladesh was the only um, USAID funded co uh, case study in that set. Um, the others were funded by other donors, but um, it, basically the reason we're not seeing as many is that this work is quite new. So we have been looking into applying WEA um, more broadly in market systems and market inclusion projects. And now we actually have uh, the instruments available on the way a resource center. We'll post the link in the chat shortly. Uh, and so um, you are all welcome if you're interested in using these. Those are now available. Um, so just visit the resource center. Um, and then Lindsay, I don't know, did you see any, was there anything on market systems that jumped out at you in it's part of that data? Um, you know, there was a lot of value chain. Um, it was used a lot in terms of value chains, looking at market linkages between, um, you know, both horizontal and vertical. Um, but I, yeah, that would be another thing I'd have to look in more deeply just off, my, off the top of my head. I know value chains in general is a, is a very important topic that was covered a lot. Right. Yeah. So that's really resonating with what we've been hearing also from other users. Um, okay. So let's move on. So back to you again, Akhtar. So um, Aishad Abdu uh, from McGill University uh, says, interesting presentations. I wanted to hear more about how the way of results were used to inform the policies in Bangladesh. Was the government involved in the design of the project or how did the project get them involved? Are there other country examples as well? Thank you. Okay. So we uh, was used in terms of policy as i presented uh you know uh, uh bangladesh's 2018 uh, agricultural policy uh, framework uh included women's empowerment as one of the you know key uh, areas of policy and that was influenced by uh if is uh, we are uh, research so but other than that, also, as I uh, showed that uh, this ANGEL project, Agriculture, Nutrition and General Linkages, that is very much related to women's empowerment. I mean, that uh, ANGEL study evolved from, uh, you know, uh, we as uh, research that uh, we conducted uh, using this uh, Bangladesh Integrated Health Survey. So that is a, a very influential, um, uh, uh, sort of project, uh, pilot project, which was implemented by the government. And, you know, this is an example that how, you know, rigorous uh, research uh, is, uh, you know, first disseminated uh, to the government and, and then government implements uh, this uh, rigorous uh, research. This is the uh, first instance in Bangladesh that that, that, that happened. This angel and recently the government has uh, approved uh, scaling up of angel uh, nationally. So, so these are the influences that uh, and there are some other instances also 
in the five year national five year plan document uh, it mentions uh, OEA and uh, you know uh, so so there are several uh, places where uh, uh, you know we are uh, seem to have uh, influenced uh, government's uh, policies and decisions thank you and hazel i can um, i can add that we saw some um, examples as well in our survey um, the the us government global food security strategy we saw that it uses the way to continue continually ensure accountability uh, to the strategy's goals by identifying the, the economic constraints um, that, that limit women's contribution to households um, and then also uh, it was used to shape Nepal's global food security strategy uh, country plan to focus on activities um, increasing women's participation in, in groups and improving access to resources um, so, so those are two other examples Okay, great, thank you. Um, okay, so Nusrat Zaitun Hosseinin asked, is there any published article related to the ProWaya for public consumption? And I'm pleased to say, yes, there are many. Um, actually, uh, all of our papers on ProWaya, they're all public access. Um, there's, if you go to the waya.ifpre.info um, resource center, there is a tab on publications where you can find all kinds of publications, not just IFPRI publications, but uh, everything that has used um, the tools. Um, the, we also have our instruments and guides available. And most importantly, we have now a distance learning course also, where you can learn about how to implement ProWEA. The first course is a foundations course. It's available in multiple languages. Um, I think English, French, Arabic, we have Spanish coming soon. So that's a self-paced distance learning course. And then we have other modules around survey implementation, qualitative. I think we have an upcoming one on index computation coming up soon. So there's a lot of training material available online if you're interested. I just wanted to make sure you're all aware of that. There is quite a lot of material already on the tools. Um, Okay, uh, next, um, uh, back to you, I guess, Lindsay, but anybody can feel free to jump in. Um, Becky Bennett from ABD Associates. I think I heard Lindsay note that the WEA was not used for or with production as much as for nutrition and dietary diversity. Is there any concern about that? Um, E.g. neglecting women's empowerment regarding productivity and the associated economic benefits. Yeah, so it's not actually, yeah, it's not actually that it wasn't used as much. Um, overall, the usage of the way has been increasing in all sectors. It's just as, as a percentage of usage, we're seeing a rise in, in nutrition, in the use of nutrition. So it's still being used a lot in, in production. It's just that uh, as a percentage of overall usage, we're seeing an increase in other, in other sectors. I'm just showing the tools kind of versatility to, to look at what other dimensions of women's empowerment, but it is still very much, um, women's uh, but agricultural production is still by far the, the highest usage. Yeah, I, I also want to add that I think one um, limitation is when the WEA is used in a survey, uh, often, you know, because nutrition surveys already interview women, it was easier, especially in the beginning, it was easier for the surveys to just add on the WEA module because they're already reaching the women in their interviews. For agricultural surveys, that's not always easy. So especially if they're, you know, they're operating from uh, this, um, you know, logistically, they're maybe interviewing only the household head or one person in the household, and they're not set up to interview women. I think what we've seen is that in some cases, they opted not to collect the agricultural production module in the same sampling frame as the WEA module. And what that means is that it then becomes really difficult to do those analyses because you don't have the information for the same respondent or for, this, for the same household. So that I think that's one like practical limitation that the data, you know, nutrition and the WEA data were collected together more often, more frequently than the agricultural production data. But we do uh, recommend strongly that if you're interested in agricultural production and want to relate that to way, to empowerment, that it does make sense to collect that together, and that's going to give you a lot more, um, uh, you know, and a, a lot more ability to analyze those connections. 
So I hope that was helpful. I think that's why BIHS was so powerful because it basically collected all kinds of data and they were able to really look at these correlations across. And that's why, you know, Akhtar was able to come up with all these insights um, using that and it's nationally representative. So I think that really kind of um, showed the value of using WEA alongside the other modules. Okay. Um, the actor, when is the next BIHS survey going to begin? <laughs> okay, so as, uh, we completed three rounds of uh, survey in 2011-12, that was the baseline, and then 2015 midline, and 2018-19, uh, that was the end line of Feed the Future phase one. Now, uh, uh, USAID Bangladesh has started Feed the Future phase two, which is also called uh, GFSS, uh, Global Food Security Strategy. So for this GFSS, we have conducted also a baseline survey in 2019, and then 2022, we completed the second round of uh, BIHS, uh, and uh, the third round is planned for 2024. So that would be, uh, supposed to be in line for the second phase of uh, Feed the Future program in Bangladesh. Okay, thank you. thank you for the clarification. I'm gonna stay with you, actor, because there's a really tantalizing question from Anne Swindale just now. Um, how was Angel's design changed or finalized prior to government scaling based on the outcomes of the RCT that if pre-conducted? comparing the four different combinations of intervention. Uh, I'm sorry, how was ANGEL? Uh, how was ANGEL's design fine changed? Or I guess the question is, what, was there, um, before it was scaled up, were there any specific kind of changes that were coming out specifically out of those recommendations from the RCT? Hmm. Okay, so uh, ANGEL uh, study, was uh, conducted, it was over in uh, 2018. And from 2018 to 2020, during these four years, uh, government of Bangladesh went back and forth with uh, IFPRI uh, to design a national scale up. And for that, you know, uh, the government thought that it should be scaled up uh, on a limited basis first, say about uh, one fourth of the uh, sub districts in Bangladesh, and then it will be scaled up, uh, you know, all the uh, uh, all over the country. And the uh, intervention that the government wants to implement is uh, agriculture and nutrition training combined and also this uh, gender sensitization. So that is one of the, what we call, you know, treatment arm of this randomized control trial. So that is the one that I think, uh, you know, the government is interested uh, to implement in the scale up. Is that? So, and I hope that was, that was clear now. Um, okay, so let me come back to Lindsay from, Jonah Rapishti from Digital Green. Um, she says, I have two questions. Did you find or see anything surprising in the data? And also, since this is such rich data, do you have any findings on what type of activities or interventions are effective in nudging and improving effectiveness in agriculture, for example, and what type of interventions are less successful? Yeah, I love that question. That's um, one of our favorite things to look at is the success of interventions as reported in um, in documents. And because you have so much data, even though it's qualitative, you can make it quantitative by creating those ratings and then uh, looking at it over time. That wasn't in the scope of, of this project to look at success itself, but we did have some um, you know, surprising findings just to see the, the way the usage of the WEA has been changed and evolving over the last uh, 10 decades and, and those trends. 
Um, and, and from those trends, really be able to see that the importance of it increasing and measuring other aspects apart from agriculture. So just to see the evolution of it and how it's been uh, been changing, and, and that leads us to believe that it will continue to, to measure, um, to move on to other uh, themes like environment, um, education, to really show that, that women's empowerment is a keystone uh, across so many different key, key themes uh, outside of agriculture. For me, was the most surprising aspect. I don't know, Hazel, if you if you had were surprised by anything. Um. Yeah, that's a good question. What was surprise? I was surprised by how many. I think the sheer number <laughs> was a surprise. I mean, um, you know, I I think when we started, I think we first said, oh, maybe we need to broaden the search beyond the development clearinghouse because we may not find enough. And then when you did their first search, it's like, oh, there's there's a lot. <laughs> there was how many was it, Lindsay? That first is thousand. Uh, yeah, oh, oh. About over two thousand five hundred. Two thousand five hundred. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I mean, like mentioned. So I think that was that was quite surprising because sometimes we even when we track our the user base, we know it's underreported, but we don't know the scale by which it's underreported, and that's I guess the beauty of kind of measuring, right? Um, it, it brings that to four. Um, okay, so let me go back. This is a bit more of an implementation question and maybe actor can help me. Um, Gwyneth Coates asks, when my organization used the ProWaya tool in Cambodia, we found that the questions were very difficult for respondents to understand, even after careful translation and back translation. Can you share any best practices to improve the implementation of the ProWaya tool? Um, one, okay, so you're talking, you're saying ProWaya, so I would imagine this would have been, um, there There have been some changes in some of the wordings also, or in the instrument itself between the original Waya and the ProWaya. The ProWaya definitely has benefited from all the lessons learned throughout, you know, the years of early implementation, so I would say the ProWaya questions are sort of our best, um, our best uh, questions so far, and that said, it is a challenge. Translation is important. So um, it is quite challenging. I, I like that you already did translation back translation. I think that's really important. If it's still a struggle, and you know, I, I would say I'm I'm curious if you also tried the qualitative tools in the ProWaya protocols, because part of that um, tries to get at the local understandings of empowerment and maybe that might help kind of unlock how um, the community themselves are thinking of empowerment and maybe that's where the that's where the mismatch is so I would say you know if if the quantitative tool is not you don't think it's it's working or it's not picking up what you think it should pick up I would say try the other tools because you may be but you may kind of uncover something else going on so I hope that's helpful. Um, I don't know if there anybody wants to jump in um, on that. Otherwise, maybe we can move on. Um, okay, Elizabeth Wellenin asks, hello, what is the thinking around the use of WEA as a tool to measure women's empowerment in non-agricultural communities? For example, among wage workers in urban or peri-urban contexts. Um, you talked about our that study we did, actor around measuring empowerment for wage workers. <laughs> any any reflections around that or uh, other other thoughts around just using way broadly in non-agriculture settings? Um, well, I, I, I think, you know, with uh, some uh, modification, uh, we can use we are for non agriculture also so that is uh, possible currently what we do is we select from our survey when we do the analysis uh, of we are we uh, select only agricultural households not other households you know but you know if we uh, want to measure um, you know other areas besides uh, agriculture then i think it can be done but you know we probably need to you know uh, uh, modify 
the, the the instrument. But uh, you you are an expert, <laughs> I think. Yes, uh, you know. I have. I have I have thoughts. Um, uh, first, to say that the ProWaya is actually ha has moved towards broadening to livelihoods, so it covers. So I think the, the original Waya was really focused on agricultural production. That has since been expanded. So if you look, for example, at the latest tools, it covers you know not just production but processing, marketing as well. It also covers all kinds of other livelihoods. So um, you know, um, even if a person was uh, engaged in non-farm activities or non-agricultural activities, all of those would be captured in the ProWaya. And um, I think we've kind of designed it to be um, a bit more general. So, um, so I think that's like like actor said. You know, the the activities that don't apply. So you know the if there's no production, obviously that will not apply. You don't need to ask about that. But there are quite a lot of indicators, I think, that are applicable beyond agriculture. So I, I would say there is room for that. Now that said, I do want to mention that ProWaya is designed um, specifically for impact assessment and project use. Um, and so uh, that's the tool. Um, we are also developing a national uh, metric for uh, um, a women's empowerment metric for national statistical systems and that that's intended to be kind of broadly used at the population level for national uh, for national statistical systems and it will go beyond just agriculture um, that work is in progress but just kind of mentioning I think later in the year we will have more to share around that so please stay tuned but if you're doing, a, you know, um, an intervention, a project, I think ProWaya is still your kind of best approach, especially because it has that counterpart qual, qual uh, protocols that you, you definitely need to use together to kind of understand um, empowerment in your setting. And, and, and if you want to measure impact, then I think that's the tool. Um, yeah, so that's what I think. Um, <laughs> uh, and others, I know that there are other team members from the WEA who are on the call. And I'm sure some of you are already doing that. Um, there's a question here, a rather general question uh, for you, actor, from Anita Campion. Um, how have women benefited from the policy changes in Bangladesh? Hmm. Um, I think uh, Bangladesh is uh, a showcase country or targeted policy towards women. There has been, you know, a lot of uh, policy changes in Bangladesh uh, for the uh, uh, to to benefit women, and that's not only by the government. Uh, the largest player. One of the you know uh, largest players are the national NGOs like BRAC. Uh, so so uh, BRAC programs uh, is a nationwide program and, and they have uh, many uh, activities to empower women to benefit women. Uh, but also uh, uh, government uh, policies, as I said, you know agriculture. National agriculture policy has included, you know, uh, women's empowerment is one as one of the objective policy objective. So that uh, was not there uh, before. We are uh, work was uh, known by by the policymakers. So it was done in 2018, and now uh, the government, uh, you know, uh, implementers uh, they are uh, sort of mandated to. Uh, to to you know implement uh, uh, activities uh, uh, programs and uh, you know projects that can uh, benefit uh, uh, women in general. But as I said, uh, Bangladesh has really done a lot uh, to to uh, empower women to uh, benefit uh, women from you know through various various uh, programs. So yeah. Great, thank you, actor. Um, okay, so somebody, uh, Emmanuel Wistos in Coombe asks, um, what consideration um, must 
uh, be used, I guess, to inform the type of way to use. And so I just want to mention that there is a tool uh, to help you decide what type of way uh, you uh, can use, and it's on our resource center. So that's um, wea.ifpre.info. And on that homepage, you'll see a link that says choosing the right wea, and it'll walk you through kind of a decision tree that'll help you pick the right tool depending on your circumstances. So I hope that's helpful. Um, okay, so let's move to Claire Baker's questions. So we recently conducted a farmer survey as part of a grant, but the way it was cost prohibitive for us for a small organization. Is an even more abbreviated way going to be created for easier use by small uh, ground level organizations or alternatively and better for us, could USAID conduct the survey for organizations? So I'll leave the USAID question to Farzana if you wanna weigh in. Um, live or in the chat, um, but in terms of a, a smaller AWEA, yeah. So AWEA collects six out of the 10 indicators. Um, and so that's, uh, that is, you know, about 30% shorter than the original, but it is still long, especially you're ha you have to interview both men and women. So I, I do understand that that can still be prohibitive. Um, we are, um, uh, also developing kind of uh, a shorter version of ProWEA, uh, also in progress. But in the meantime, I think um, if you can't um, collect the whole thing, I would say take a look at your theory of change very carefully and then um, make sure, I mean, try to see if there's a specific indicator that's of, uh, you know, prime importance and just focus on those few ones. So um, that's obviously not ideal, but if you can do that, I think even that step will help you really um, understand uh, at least some uh, some areas of empowerment in your in your setting. Um, for for Zana, the question was whether uh, for Zana uh, whether USAID can can co collect the survey for small organizations because often it's hard um, for for them to do that. Yeah. Yes. Uh, great question, uh, Claire. Um, and I think there's two ways, and you know, Lindsay's work also, um, I think, highlighted this as well as uh, the example from Bangladesh, uh, where in Feed the Future target countries, we do have um, a zone of influence level data from our population-based surveys, which can be used uh, as a context. Um, source of data or a data point, depending on how uh, you would need uh, to use the data to inform either the design of a project or um, potential targeting. Uh, so there, you know, we'd really like to increase the use of our population-based survey data. That comes out every few years. Um, you can check out uh, the Feed the Future page or um, even Lindsay's uh, dashboard when that's, that goes live, uh, which will include sort of all of the use cases. Um, at the same time, as Hazel uh, just uh, talked about that, you know, there are ways to potentially streamline, even in our own population-based survey. For example, we collect the abbreviated WIA at baseline and endline from both uh, women and men respondents, but for the midline, we only collect it from female respondents. Um, so there are different um, creative ways to innovate uh, and to streamline, and I would uh, recommend looking at some of the suggestions that Hazel just provided, as well as the approach we took for our population-based surveys. Um, I hope that helps. Yeah, great. Thank you, Farzana. So we are coming up to time, so thank you so much to everybody. This has been an excellent session. Thank you for the audience, all your questions, comments, and very active engagement. As we mentioned, the recording and the slides will be shared after this. Um, I did mention earlier that we are launching a series of WEA briefs that will synthesize and highlight key findings and lessons from the WEA data and the studies have, that have been done using this data across different contexts and themes. And the first two briefs will be on these topics we discussed today, so do watch out for that. Um, I encourage you all to subscribe to our mailing list. So we have at our WEA Resource Center, wea.ifpre.info, um, there is a sign up there. And then uh, we also have a D group at the CGIR Gender Impact Platform website. 
to get the latest publications and announcements. So we'll drop those links in the chat so you can sign up. And also we are celebrating Gender Month in AgriLinks. And so there is an entire collection there for you. Lots of interesting events, publications, other resources on gender, including this one. Um, so in case you missed it, please take a look at that page. The link in will, will be in the chat also. Uh, and so finally, just this, I just wanna thank our speakers today, Lindsay and Akter, thank you so much that you gave us a lot of food for thought. Um, our host has AgriLinks, Michael, Liz, Shantice, and team, thank you for coordinating. And then of course, Farzana and Meredith at USAID, special shout out to you guys um, for all the support for the way throughout the years. And so this concludes our webinar. Thank you everybody and have a great rest of your day. Bye everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.